Yeah. And. We are continuing our series, our Advent Christmas series. Called unwrapping the gift, and uh, you know we uh, certainly want to uh, appreciate you. Uh, last week we were supposed to have uh, continued the series, and I got sick, and we had to call Pastor Don an hour before the nine a.m. service and told him to get out. And so I said I couldn't come, uh, so we're just picking up kind of where we left off, and uh, looking very much excitedly at the season of Advent. Advent is the time of the year, six weeks, uh, or it begins the, the uh, week after Thanksgiving. And it gives us an opportunity uh, to imagine as people of God what's at stake for the coming of Jesus. And uh, during this time, in this season of Advent, we are reminded uh, that Jesus came to change everything. Came to change the whole world. Came to even change us. And how many of you know that? Uh, you know uh, the, the the introduction of Jesus leaves nothing the same. Amen. 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 You know I don't know if you ever met anyone who can kind of come into a space and just change the space just by their presence there. In Berkeley, you know, a place you call, you know, folks have a different kind of energy. <laughs> like every time you come here, you have a different kind of energy. <laughs> you may know some folk who uh, have on so much perfume or cologne and come in a room and it just announce their life. Some of you may be sitting next to some folks right now. Figure out what's going on. It's just that kind of thing. Jesus comes to just change everything. And more than Santa Claus and Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer and you know all the, the kind of you know uh, practices of of Christmas that are you know less about Jesus and more just about the holiday. Uh, this is an opportunity for us as people of God to really think about the gift that Christ brings during this Christmas season and to appreciate that Christ comes uh, not to. Uh, uh, you know, leave things in their present state, but to radically reorder some things. Now, this particular book of the Bible, the book of Matthew, was written uh, by a follower of Jesus, a disciple whose actual name was Matthew. Thus, the gospel according to Matthew. And Matthew uh, was writing his particular account to an audience that was largely Jewish. And it's important just, you know, mention all a couple of these things, just so you have a little bit of a context of the kind of radicality of this passage and of this particular letter. Matthew was a tax collector. So Matthew was one of these folk that the Jewish people hated. He was a Jew himself, but he was a tax collector. They called him like kind of double agents, you know. You're a part of the people, but you work for the system. And the tax collectors were known to, to, to uh, extort more taxes than necessary and line their own pockets, right? So the Jewish people hated the tax collectors. But when Jesus made an introduction to Matthew, he transformed into a follower of Jesus. And it just goes to show you that God is not really hung up on who likes you or who don't like you. And God is not necessarily hung up on your occupation either. Uh, because God chose one of the most hated kind of Jewish folk to actually make one of the best presentations of the gospel to the Jewish audience. And I just want you to know that uh, never disqualify yourself when God decides to qualify you. Amen. Just you know, a whole lot of you know, uh, blessing. All right, so let's take a look at Matthew chapter number three. Let's see what the word of God gives to us today. Uh, chapter number three, verse one, page 784 of the church Bibles. It says, in those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And this is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke. 
when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Now John the Baptist wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Ain't that some kind of a diet? And the fashion statement. <laughs> then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him in all the region along the Jordan. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. Let me just give you a little bit of a snapshot of what this may look like in today's society. Uh, you know, it'd be like just this guy who was out there kind of uh, in the, you know, the, the countryside, you know, that, that 580 road on your way to like Tracy, and you know, it's got those mountains, you know, through all that, you know, those windmills. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. It'd be like just this random guy standing out there wearing camel cloth. Hair, a leather belt. It's funny. Actually, I was walking on my way to a meeting. And I saw a guy walk down the escalator, and all he had on, I don't know if it was camel hair, but he just had on this something. I told my wife about it. I said, this guy, he with some boots on and just no pants and just some, some cars. And I said, John! <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. I mean, I didn't see that guy. I thought it was. out of the message for you guys. But he is out there in the middle of nowhere. And people coming from all the cities in the region just to hear his message. Right? He must have had some kind of a compelling message. And his message was not, if you give me $20, I'll give you $100. <laughs> it wasn't a message about, you know, uh, 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 a house is, is going to miraculously appear right in the middle of the hood. It wasn't about you being wealthy and healthy and on your pro It was about repentance. And I just continue to imagine, you know, God give us in this age the kind of compelling, attractive, bold message of repentance. We'll talk a little bit about what that was. So, so John, you got this random guy out in the middle of the way. And then verse number seven, when John saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these are all the religious leaders of the day, coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers. And John was holy. No. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? This is where our sermon really will kind of come from. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Everybody say that. Bear fruit, Bear fruit. Worthy, of worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say of yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be unto God. Amen. So we're going to talk today about the gift of repentance. Everybody say that. The gift of repentance. Come on, one more time. The gift of repentance. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that is read for us, the people. God, we ask you to hide this word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. And rest upon me and even the hearers of this word in Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen. All right. Tell your neighbor, I'm unwrapping the gift. Tell them that I'm unwrapping. Give your hands like you unwrapping. You know, I'm unwrapping. Now, if you're anything like me, it is very difficult to admit when you're wrong. Any folks just like to admit they're wrong? You know, I just, I'm just wrong. Be like me, and, 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 and it's even more difficult to admit when I'm wrong to people who are close to me. You know, I can admit to folk all day long, I don't really know, ain't no real kind of like, yeah, I was wrong, my bad, peace, you know, I'm never gonna see you again. <laughs> but the people that, you know, you just, because, you know, just keep being wrong all the time, kind of starts to mess with your character a little bit, your integrity. You don't want people to think you shady and, you know, you know, good for nothing and whatnot. Uh, hard to admit 
when you're wrong. Sometimes it's hard to admit when you're going the wrong way. I can remember many a time before GPS and iPhones and all that stuff. You know, I would just drive, especially, you know, and this is when I had photographic memory. So someone tell me directions, and I just, you know, see a few minutes, and I'll be driving. You know, 10 minute drive turned into a 30 minute odyssey, right? And you know, you're driving and you're trying to figure out, man, you know, why do I keep seeing this same tree? Like, <laughs> this is a popular tree. Rather than pulling over and just asking people, you know, uh, how do I get to, you know, Martin Luther King Boulevard? So, you know, I don't like to admit when I'm wrong, and sometimes it's so important for us to have people in our lives who love us enough to help point us or put us back on the right path. Yeah. Now, I'm scared of the brother and the sister who don't ever feel like they are wrong, or that everybody else is wrong, or that they don't ever need nobody to put them on the right path. You know, uh, my dad used to tell, tell us, you know, sons, not everybody can be wrong. Right. <laughs> 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 Cardi, me remember that, Cardi, like, you know, that, that, uh, you know, everybody can't be wrong. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe one or two, but it starts to get into the dozens of yeah, people telling you the same thing. Say that. Hmm. Let me take my Jackson theology and take a look in the mirror. That's right. <laughs> Asking how to change your way. So, 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 so part of what this passage and this season, at the season, the gift of this season is about, is about Jesus kind of coming to the world to remind us that there is a way of living that is more superior than the ways of living we have now. And that there are all these things that work their way, their way into Christmas and into Advent, but more importantly than the things, it is this reality that God, when God comes, he comes to change yeah, right. us right. and to remind us that there's something that may need a little bit of correction. Yes. Now, in the biblical times, this person who was assigned to this role was called a prophet. And the prophet was always sent to the people of God. The prophet never went to the people who did not follow God. So that's important for us to appreciate, right? Because people who do not know the ways of God or follow the ways of God cannot be held responsible for the promises that they made to God. Right? So you know, you know, that's why the church can't become the judge for the world. The church should be trying to get the church together Amen. and make the church such a welcoming and, 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 and space of truth and, 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 and love that folks want to run into the church. But then we out here like trying to preach to the world and the world don't even believe what we believe. It's like, well, you know, no wonder you ain't doing what the Bible says because you don't believe in the Bible. Ain't that something? Like, you know, you know, uh, uh, well, I, I don't really make a point. I just keep moving. Uh, but, 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 but the point is that the role of the prophet is to bring the people of God back to covenant relationship with God. In the Hebrew scriptures, the nation of Israel consistently uh, forsook their promise to worship God and have no idols. They consistently made decisions that they were not going to fulfill the covenant, the promise they made with God, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you know, because back then, Abraham and them didn't have no God to worship, so God said, well, I'm going to make you my people. And they're like, cool! Everybody else got a God, and we ain't got no God. And, and, and they said, well, we're going to make you our God. And I was like, all right now. Let me tell you what that means. That means that you can't worship any other gods. It's like, yes, we like that. Can't be jealous. Yes, can't murder. Yes, you know, all these things, you know, they said yes real quick. Kind of like us, you know. You ever had this like spiritual moment with 
with God and, you know, the song was just right or the, or the, or the preacher was just, you know, what you need to hear. And, or, or, and you're like, yes, God, whatever you say, I'll go, I'll do whatever. If it's him, if it's her, if it's them, if it's those, God, I'm just there. And then, like, you know, 10 minutes after service, <laughs> like, him shows up and him is, you know, him.
You need like a set up person. Because you know, God come with the truth so pure, it'll like mess you up. You know, because he needs someone like prime the pump. Amen. Uh, that's what God do is the priming of the pump. And John the Baptist came to kind of grease the skin, to prepare everybody for what he said, someone who's coming, whose shoes you can't even tie. That's a bad nigga. <laughs> Old Testament of the Hebrew uh, scriptures, and he fell within the lineage of, of the prophets before him. Uh, if you keep reading in the gospel, you'll see that John the Baptist got the same kind of treatment as the prophets before him. John the Baptist didn't end up on the king's payroll. John the Baptist ended up with his head on the king's plaque. John the Baptist told the king, why are you sleeping with your daughter? Yeah. The king didn't like that. It's like, man, mind your business. John the Baptist, you know, out there on the country. Tell him, buddy, the reason why our people are in such disarray, why we're in bondage, because we have perverted leadership. Leadership that does not follow the ways of God. And I got to tell you, you know, when you got someone who's willing to, like, tell the truth like that, yeah. You're not going to just get, you know, like friends and, and folk. That's why you got to be real careful who you push away from you. Because they tell you things you don't like to hear. Yeah, say that. Now, you know, it, it, you know, there's some folk who are just too anxious to be a prophet. That's how I know you're not one. <laughs> I don't mean no harm brought by Christianese friends out there and the titles of prophets and all these things. But if you are a prophet, uh, you probably don't want to be one because prophets do not have ministries. Prophets be running for their lives, you know. Prophets, you know, a good prophet example is Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, God, I don't want to talk. I'm tired. Telling the king all this stuff. I just, I just want to go home. He told God, you seduced me. You tricked me, God, into this talking. <laughs> but when I don't talk, All right, uh, I'm like, uh, I'm like, uh, just shut up in my phone. Yeah. I got to say something yeah. because the, 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 the pain I feel Let from the know. people that don't oh. like to hear it, yeah. Is worse. It's not worse than the pain I feel when it's inside of me disobeying what you told me to do. Now, you know, we got a lot of folks who, pro who pro call themselves prophets, but there's no consequences to them being a prophet. But these prophets, boy, if you say stuff against the king, boy, you tore up like head on, on the plaque. So John the Baptist is one of these prophets who are out here trying to charge the people back into right relationship with God. And in this moment, his message is one of repentance. It is one that challenges all of the folks listening to him. Listen, we must change. Repentance in the Greek uh, is a word called metanoia. And it means to make a U-turn. Huh? So it means that when you are, are, are going in one direction, repentance is to acknowledge that the direction I'm going is getting me further from God's purposes. So the gift is that I get to turn around. Come on. Amen. Okay. Say it again. Bear fruit. Bear fruit. Worthy. Worthy. Of repentance. 
Thanks, Steve. 
<laughs> God, I get in my car. He spoke truth to me. He was my prophet. He was my John the Baptist. He was telling me that I had to bear fruit. This thing in my life, I had to bring it to God. And I want to remind you, child of God, that this is a gift. Because when you don't bring the things to God and you try to carry them yourself, you rob God of an opportunity to take good care of you. In a chair that is too big for you to fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you ever seen like someone wearing, you know, uh, uh, or just in over their head, you know. Uh, you know, it's like basketball games. You know, I love playing basketball. I used to when I was a little more in shape to have a better game. Um, but it'd be like me, like out of shape, trying to go play basketball in the NBA. I know the rules, but I'm over my head. And when you try to deal with your own stuff, and you don't make the U-turn, you remain over your head. Yes. And that gives you and I the opportunity to realize, man, God, I got to make some changes. I got to bring, bear fruit. Repentance can't just be something that I do in my mind. I'm going to repent in my mind. No, you got to bring something concrete. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just gonna repent of my sin. Not good enough. God wants some specificity out of some of us. Because the generalities is what's killing us. Yeah. You see, God, I'm sorry for my sin. Which ones? <laughs> Which ones you gonna change? I'm just sorry. That not make no sense. I'm just sorry. I'm just sorry, God. Man, you should accept my apology. <laughs> no. Repentance is not just about you taking you sorry. It's about you taking responsibility. It's about you acknowledging that you're wrong. It's about you making necessary steps to not engage in that same kind of behavior again. It's about you making the U-turn. And whatever that thing is in your life, you better bear fruit. Yes. Think about bearing fruit. A tree that don't bear fruit gets cut down. So you better, put, you better, you, you, you better start watering that repentant tree in your life. Some apples or some bananas or some oranges or some lemons or something. Then it start coming on that tree. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, bear fruit, bear fruit, bear fruit. The second thing, worthy. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Understand, child of God, that whatever it is you're trying to repent from needs to cost you something. Don't be, don't be repenting. It's like, I've been learning peanut butter. I use all the time. I'm not repenting of eating peanut butter. I don't eat peanut butter. That ain't costing me anything. Right. Now that piece cobbler. <laughs> there's a lot of her picture going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it cost me something. It ought to cost you something. It ought to be something that you don't want to give up, but you know if you don't give it up, right. you cannot be who God has called you to be. Right. Now, understand, John? These are the 
those who culturally kind of removed themselves from Roman uh, culture because they did not want to be contaminated with it. So they were hermits. They lived out in the middle of, you know, the wilderness and they, you know, held to their strict dietary laws. John the Baptist was one of these kind of folk, many people thought. He came out of the sect of the Essenes. Then you had the Zealots. And the Zealots were the revolutionaries. Have you ever met a revolutionary, right? You know, we're gonna burn the system down. You know, you know they can't, you can't be nothing standing. It's, you know, it's just about to be, you know, just, just, you know, do you want a revolution? Woo, woo! You know, that kind of stuff. Revolution, revolution, revolution. Me, mayor, full of revolutionary, right? Everybody wants to be revolutionary, nobody wants to sacrifice nothing. Revolutionary about everything outside of ourselves, but can't think about how to live revolutionary within ourselves. Y'all know revolutionaries, right? I'm scared of revolutionaries. I'm scared, you know, when you're young, you ain't got nothing to lose. When you start having family and kids, and, you know, you start to realize, man, I can't be out here just yeah. blowing up buildings. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then you had the, 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 the Sadducees. And the Sadducees were a group of folks who were very humanistic, post-religious almost, pragmatic. They didn't believe in an afterlife. So they said, we just got to live our life to the fullest with no regret for any consequences, eternal or in this life. We just, we just going to do what we're going to do. It's the type of the YOLO crowd. Right? Just, you only live once crowd, you know. So just, you know, no God, no consequences, just live life. I mean, no folk like that. Yeah. It's just like, you know, there ain't no God. I'm just going to do what I do. And, you know, I'm my own judge. Yeah. They had the Pharisees. And these were the kind of religious, middle class folk who vacillated between uh, separatist type, you know, cultural ways of life, uh, wanting to maintain their, you know, you know uh, cultural Jewish pride. But they also realized that we have to collaborate with the state. But the Roman Empire to uh, ensure our survival. That's probably what most of us are. We the Pharisees. The folk that just, you know, kind of, you know, we, 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 we don't want no problems. You know, you, 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 know, you don't mess with me, I don't mess with you. Exactly. <laughs> let me go get my job, let me, you know, get my, my house picket fence, you know, just leave me alone, let my family, you know, y'all just, you know, don't fool with me. And I go to church, I, you know, sometime, time, time, give two dollars, something in an offering. You know, I vote, you know, once in my lifetime, with another black candidate, you know, another white candidate, you know, someone that I like. But I don't want no problems. Amen. That's, that's kind of fair. So when John sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees show up, John is realizing both y'all got some things that you gotta give up. David said like this, I will not offer to God that which costs me nothing. And John the Baptist is one of these kind of folk who see that you can be post-religious or you can be uber-religious. But there's always space in our lives to give God something that costs us. Yes, yes, yes. Praise God. Yes, yes. This is the gift of repentance. The gift of Advent that God don't just let you go along your way unimpeded. Uh, uh, it's got to cost you something. It got to be something that you, you know, See, you see, you see that little money up there. You know, I put that up because that's, the, you know, that's that's really the thing that we we value most, most of us. You know, it's like the rich young ruler. Y'all, y'all, y'all heard me preach on this maybe a few times. Rich young ruler comes to see Jesus, says, "Listen, Jesus, I've done everything. Kept the laws since I was a kid. Not sinned in any way. I'm in, right? I'm good." She said, "You, you lack one thing." I said, "What is it, Jesus?" Jesus said, sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Ow! <laughs> the scripture says, he walked away shaking his head because his possessions were me. I want you to think about what is that ow! 
love. Amen. And this is why it is such a gift. Because Jesus couldn't come to the world and just tell us everything we want to hear. That's how people like to, you know, sanitize Jesus. Like they like to sanitize Mandela. Like they like to sanitize Martin Luther King. They sanitize God. They sanitize everyone. People like to make them be folk that make them feel comfortable. But Jesus didn't end up on the cross because he loved everybody. Come on. I just want to tell you that. He ended up on the cross because he was a friend. Yes. To some folk. Yes. So you and I must be real careful to not sanitize Jesus. He just came to bring hope and love, peace. He didn't come to bring all those things, but the presence of hope means that despair cannot be there. The presence of love means that hate cannot be there. So if you are a hateful person, then Jesus comes to challenge you to repent. If you are an anxious person, Jesus comes to challenge you to repent. It is a gift because this is the way God intended for you and I to be. And the question is, will you unwrap that gift? Go back to unwrapping that gift. Go ahead. Unwrap the gift of repentance. Will you be like I was?